and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. You're listening to us on our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM, as well as lakesfm.com. In addition, today, as always, we're joined by Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and so on, as well as 88.1 WBFH, The Biff. And today, we're on the Facebook page live via Facebook Live with the West Bloomfield Township Clerk's Office. And we thank Debbie Binder and her entire team over there for once again broadcasting us on their Facebook page here in the local community. And as always, joining me from her home studio is Ronnie Dahl. Tyler, some mornings are just like, <laughs> Ain't that the truth? So, you know, it's one of those things like you wake up, you start to get going. So I usually wake up between 5 and 6 a.m. Um, I, you know, take the dog out, ease into my day, this, that, and the other. But um, my husband, like, the dog wants to go out again. And so she's like, mmm, rrr, rrr, rrr. and so they're upstairs. Like and they that. sound like a herd of elephants, you know, because yeah. my husband plays with the dog. Um, I think he's doing the show tonight. So we'll be working night side. Yeah. So he decides he's going to take her to the park. But you have to get everything ready for the dog, right? Like, right. especially now in the winter time. It's like, I, for parents that are trying to work from home and, and they have toddlers, I'm like, oh my gosh, how are they doing it? Like, you have to lay out the towel, then you have to have like snacks. And then, you know, he's like, oh, we're going to the park. And um, then we saw this hack on uh, yeah. Facebook. So it, Tyler, you have cats, so you're lucky you don't have to deal with this. But if you have a dog and they go out and they get the snowballs in their feet and, you know, on their legs and stuff, and then they get to the point where they can't move, well, it was okay when we had a Cocker Spaniel. You just picked her up and carried her home. <laughs> well, Trixie is like, you know, 65 pounds. So it's not so easy to pick the dog up and carry her home. So um, on Facebook, they used a whisk. And you take the whisk and you rub it up and down your dog's paws and legs, get all the snowballs out. So my husband's like, where's the whisk? And I'm like digging. I'm like, I don't know where the whisk is. When's the last time I used a whisk, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. but with that, but they're, but they left, they went to the park. So it should be quiet for at least the next two hours. Well, that's good. Hopefully he, he found the, found the whisk or uh, you know, passes by a, a kitchen appliance store on the way over to the park and can you know, walk in, grab a whisk he needs and be like, no, don't worry about it. I'm not big. Well, what you baking, Woody? Oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm yeah, it's for my dog. But it really is. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see if it works. Now, one of the other things we do is someone got us uh, a towel warmer uh, for Christmas a few years ago. I think my sister did. So we actually um, will try to put the towel in the towel warmer for the dog. <laughs> so when we go on a walk, we put the towels to wipe her feet and everything when she comes back in. Uh, in the towel warmer, hit the on button, go for the walk, and then come back, and then she comes home to a warm towel. So that's nice. Of course, we never used it for each other. No, <laughs> right? no <I'm> like, <laughs> of course not. But uh, anyway, what we do for our pets? Oh yes, yes, the things we do for our pets, the effort that goes into making their lives enjoyable with warm towels and whisks. Uh, yeah, and but today we're um, going to be getting another huge storm, Tyler. Uh, it's going to be starting, I believe, what tonight into tomorrow. Yep. So uh, the sun is shining today. I don't know if you were up early enough to see the sunrise. It was, it was. absolutely beautiful out there today. It's yeah, it's uh, been very nice. Yeah, and so um, but uh, the sun's going to be shining today. But then we are going to be getting the winter storm starting tonight into tomorrow. And then our temperatures are going to take a deep, deep, deep dive, which since we're still under uh, winter storm warnings, that means I can keep my Christmas tree up another week, right? Why not? And uh, at this point, it's been it's been up almost a month. It's been up. I know we're, we're pushing. It's still early in February. I was going to say it's been almost, you know, two, almost two months, but it, it's still early on. You're well over a month beyond the holiday. At, the, at this point, you know, you might as well keep it up until Christmas in July and then take it down. It's a big tree, uh, but I will say I didn't put it up until late. Oh. So. Okay. It'll get, 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 get you a little bit more time, but. And it was, it's one of those new, uh, like the skinnier trees, oh. you know, that are kind of like the, you know, 
new uh, home thing. Uh, so it's not taking up a lot of space. But I know, Tyler, you just think I'm crazy, don't you? <laughs> I mean, I think it was crazy if you were, if you were, you know, running around, dancing around every night as a ritual in a, in a turkey costume. But, you know, that, I think <laughs> I think it's just, you know, a lot of people delay taking the Christmas decorations down. I, I'm frankly surprised I don't see more people that still have, you know, their rock and roll snowmen in their front yard when I drive, when I drive home. I do see uh, still Christmas uh, lights on outdoors, but we did take down our Christmas lights. And then I did take everything off that looks more Christmassy, um, but I did leave up the winter greens. And, you know, so I think those are good until the end of the month, right? No, no that's, that, that's fine. That's okay. So with that, uh, it is Thursday, uh, the 4th of February already. Uh, just 10 days, Tyler, until Valentine's Day. You probably aren't even thinking about it yet, are you? Why would I? This, 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 I got no reason to think about it. It's Valentine's Day. It's another. It's another useless holiday. So yeah, I'll just go right through it. Tyler, <laughs> ha, says the single guy. Well, of course, hey, exactly. For yeah, for single people, it's a useless holiday. And you know, in general, it's maybe not. I mean, more people, well, it, it, they, they got to put some thought into it. But what, 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 what the hell do I need to think about it for? So Tyler, I'll give you a little tip because typically over the last few years, my husband's had to work on Valentine's Day and in the evening. So we don't really celebrate it too much. We've been married 10 years, eh, you know, but um, if like we have Google and Alexa at home, but if you say, um, uh, if you ask Google to serenade you, and I'm not going to say it here, yeah, I have a Google yeah, in, in the yeah, office, so it's <laughs> going to start singing, uh, Google will serenade you and be your Valentine. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's interesting. That's uh, it, kind of creepy, but interesting. Um, I, I do, I do on that note. You, know, you don't want to say the words that are going to set off your your smart home device or your Siri device or whatever it, you may be using. Uh, I I hate these commercials that come on on TV and on radio that are like, oh, for more information, you know, download our app. Hey, this particular app, go ahead, find me more information. Like, oh, you're just gonna trigger that for people? Come on. That's why, right. that's why I've, I've started, I, I've decided any time a commercial of any kind asks someone a question, I'm just going to yell out no. Just blurt out no, no matter who I'm, I'm around, what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, I'm just going to yell no. You're, the question is always no. For all you advertisers out there, the question's forever going to be no. <laughs> it is interesting. Like, I, I like them. Um, we have two Google Homes downstairs, but then Alexa upstairs. Um, so it does work. But my sister, uh, I got them all like the Googles for a Christmas a few years ago. And they came, she gave me hers back because she was like, they're listening to us. I don't want it in my house. I'm like, okay, I'll use it. <laughs> and if someone's listening to me, Tyler, Bless them because our conversations aren't that, uh, you know, enticing here in the Woodruff household. Let me tell you, it's usually about Trixie sports or, you know, Pinterest or HGTV. All the most interesting things that people that want to listen in on people's conversations really want to know about, right? Exactly. But with that, that's uh, the daily rant for you. Tyler, just wait until you get married one day. Boy, my hus poor husband, his life has definitely changed. <laughs> oh, boy. So with that, we can jump into the headlines today. Uh, Michigan is going to be offering a weekly COVID-19 testing for teachers. So they're going to be offering the weekly COVID-19 test to teachers in both private and public schools with the hope of achieving the governor's goal of all schools offering in-person instruction by March the 1st. So the Michigan Safe Schools Testing Program will provide the supplies for the COVID-19 or rapid test to schools at no cost to the districts. So far about 300 schools and about 9,000 staff members have signed up for the testing so far. The program is modeled, by the way, after the Michigan's pilot project that tested the student athletes and the coaches who were participating in the playoffs for high school sports. So in that program, more than 8,300 people were tested and it resulted in the detection of 69 asymptomatic COVID-19 cases that otherwise would have been missed. So now they are taking that program that works so well for the high school sports and they are going to be implementing it for the teachers because 
not every teacher is going to be able to get vaccinated and some don't want to get vaccinated, but you know, for others, it's still kind of a slow rollout for some of the teachers to get the vaccine as well. And the teachers are around so many kids over the course of the day, whether it be in their class or passing through the halls, uh, they're interacting with each other. So there's crossover between one classroom to another, one school to another in some cases too. And you now that, that pilot testing program w went really well during the playoffs for high school sports. And uh, we talked to Jeff Kimberly earlier on in the week that talked about how effective that program was, how well received it was from all involved and you know that can be used to help teachers out and, and keep them safe and aware of whether or not they may have come in contact with COVID-19 or may have contracted COVID-19 and keep our in-person learning as safe as possible. It's a huge benefit uh, to both the kids of the state of Michigan who are going to be back in school and for their teachers as well. So uh, there's an interesting, uh, interesting study, by the way, um, Tyler, about the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine does more than prevent people from falling seriously ill. It appears to reduce transmission of the virus and offer strong protection for three months on just a single dose. That's the preliminary findings from Oxford University, which is also a co-developer of the vaccine. Um, and it also could vindicate the British government's strategy of delaying the second shot for up to 12 weeks so that more people can be quickly given that first dose. So up to now, the recommendation time between doses has been three to four weeks. So the research could also bring scientists closer to an answer to one of the big questions about the vaccine, vaccination drives. Will the vaccines actually curb the spread of the coronavirus? So it's not clear what implications, if any, the findings might have for the two other major vaccines being used here in the United States. It's Pfizer and Moderna. And of course, um, the AstraZeneca's uh, is in the process of trying to get approval for use here in the US, but it's looking like that may be sometime in as late as like March before it's actually available here in the US. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine um, could be available sooner in mid-February. Yeah, it is looking like J Johnson & Johnson is going to be the next uh, the, the next in line in the U.S. to be approved for distribution. Uh, good news here, at least in the U.K., with AstraZeneca with AstraZeneca's results from this study. I mean, timing's every, been everything in the vaccination process, getting, peop getting enough vaccines to where they need to be in the timing between the first shot and the second shot, making sure people come back for that second shot, making sure you're not wasting any vaccinations or, or losing them by taking them out of their safe containment and then having too few or too many available for the number of people you're vaccinating. Having that extra time in between also would allow for more people to get into the process and move that process along even quicker. So hopefully we do see some, some more good results from this AstraZeneca study and uh, that we do in the coming months get similar results from research here in the U.S. on that vaccine and uh, you know maybe that could be a huge help later on this winter and as we go into the spring to help really ramp up the vaccination process here in Michigan and across the U.S. I will say I'm lucky um, or kind of glad I'm in that last group because I'm waiting for the Johnson and Johnson. It's only one shot. Yeah. <laughs> I do not want to have two shots, but I'll, I'm okay with one. Uh, hey, uh, Tyler, do you have uh, big plans for the Super Bowl this weekend? I am going to be watching the Super Bowl alone. Uh, <clears throat> a, it's just the safest thing to be doing. B, I'd really like to be yelling as loudly as possible and not knowing the people around me when something good happens as I root for uh, the Kansas City Chiefs in this per particular, particular game. Always been a big fan of Andy Reid back to his Eagles days and uh, you know I just like to see I just like to see Patrick Mahomes pick another pick another one up especially after uh, this little scare that he and the Chiefs had this week going and getting their hair cut with someone that tested positive. Well with that uh, Fauci is warning against the Super Bowl parties becoming super spreaders because many Americans will likely want to celebrate the Sunday Super Bowl as they have in previous years with large snack filled watch parties. But Dr. Fauci is urging everyone break from tradition, prevent a potential spike in COVID-19. So Fauci uh, is imploring people to limit their gatherings to just your household members only. 
you don't want parties with people that you haven't had much contact with. You just don't know if they're infected, said Fauci. So as difficult as that is, at least this time around, just lay low and cool it. That's what Fauci is telling the yeah, American public. Cool while acknowledging that the Super Bowl is not an official national holiday, he does say it is pretty much comparable to some of the other major events that have prompted upticks in the country's COVID-19 case count, like Thanksgiving, as well as New Year's Eve. Uh, no surprise there, yeah. uh, you know, but uh, I will say so for us, um, my nephew is coming home from college. It is his 21st birthday this week, but we always celebrate his birthday um, Super Bowl weekend. So we'll be doing that Sunday. But again, um, other than Woody and I, everyone else in my family has pretty much had COVID. Uh, and, you know, as I've said here before, we think that they may have gotten it through my mother's funeral, um, but we, we've all been together. So it's, you know, like our three families coming together. There's just like, you know, six of us, eight of us. So we feel like we're safe to do so. Yeah, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're with people regular, regularly and they're in kind of your COVID bubble, I, I guess it's okay. You should still probably take some preca take precautions if you're, <clears throat> if you're doing something in that case, just to be extra safe in case you haven't had COVID or, or other people that you associate with on a regular basis haven't had COVID, but otherwise, yes, cool it. Or, you know, let's, let's, let's bring cool it down to a more local level. Imagine you're a Detroit lion and just avoid the Super Bowl altogether. Other than watching. That's too well, they've soon. Been it's too soon. They, well, well, in that case, they, they're really good at that. Then, it's true. Right? It's true. They're doing a great uh, job. We, we can learn from them. So uh, speaking of that, just as a reminder for everyone, you can find the latest headlines, go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus tab, and that's where you'll find the latest information. Also, if you go to the CDC tab, uh, the guidelines are posted there for the Super Bowl and what people should be doing. And if you are going to be joining, uh, make sure you, you know, open the windows, or have the party outdoors is what the CDC is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Michigan, when, what, that's, it's going to be like a high of 14. I mean, you want to talk about cool it. You want to talk about cool it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in some places like California, they're that's not right. allowing bars and restaurants to have uh, TVs on. Try to prevent people yeah, from that'll gathering. stop it. Uh, so with that, though, uh, just a reminder, that's where you can get it. But with that, though, Tyler, uh, we have a great show ahead. And since you were just speaking about the Lions, our first guest on deck is nicer. going to be. <laughs> It'll be much nicer no. about them. That's one joke. I had to get out of the way. Yes. I know. Matt Deary is going to be with us. He, <clears throat> he's the host of uh, Locked on the Lions podcast. He'll be joining us uh, after this quick break on the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the Medical Director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com slash health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. 
If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. time out of your Thursday to be with us here on the mega cast as always you can catch us on Civic Center TV Birmingham area municipal access you can also tune us in right now channel 15 if you have Comcast 99 on AT&T if you're out driving around listen to us on the radio 89.3 Lakes FM 88.1 FM the Biff we also want to say thank you to the West Bloomfield Township Clerk's Office for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the mega cast on their Facebook page we are always happy that they are willing to do so. Uh, with that, we are just a few days away from the big game. This is Super Bowl weekend coming up. Will the Lions ever, ever, ever <laughs> see the Super Bowl? And could the change be on the way, though? Um, I, so, Matt, I'm looking at my notes from my husband. He says, are the Lions on track for a successful rebuild? <laughs> so with that, he says they have a new great GM, a new head coach. Is this a time for the Lions to do a 180 turnaround and start becoming contenders in the NFL? First off, Ronnie uh, and Tyler, great to see you guys again. Thanks for having me on. Um, that this is, you know, it's such a, a a crazy. It's been a crazy couple of weeks for sure, because the Lions are rebranding. The Lions are seriously this time pulling the plug and starting over. Even when they hired their new general manager Brad Holmes and the head coach Dan Campbell, they were a little bit skeptical about saying the term, using the term rebuild. Now, when you trade your franchise quarterback. Uh, that's it. I mean, it is it is a full-fledged blow-it-up situation. And I think that's okay. I do. I think trying to put the past in the past, starting over, blowing up this roster, at least especially on the defensive end, on the defensive side of the ball, where Bob Quinn put some really poor players in even worse positions, it'll take a little bit of a while. But if, if fans can have patience, and Ronnie, you know, one playoff win in, you know, 63 years, uh, you have to be patient for a couple more years. And that's exactly what I think that the Lions are preaching right now. But so far, uh, some of the hires that they've made have been pretty good. Okay, before I let Tyler jump in, I have to say, number one, it's 63 years, that's not patience. <laughs> but on top of that, <laughs> this insanity. is what happens. Sheila Ford, you put a woman in charge who says, you know what, I have people who are more knowledgeable and know more about this than I do. Let me let them do their job. Thank you to the women leaders out there who are leading. <laughs> you know, she's, it's tough, uh, Ronnie, because she's, she's inheriting a team. She's, she, she's taking over for her mother who took over for her husband, Martha's husband, Mr. Ford. And the Ford family, let's be honest here, uh, when it comes to football owners, they're losers. They just are. It has not been good. I like the fact that Sheila Ford Hamp said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to surround myself, you're right, with people that know a lot more than me. And I think the first step we saw in doing that is when they brought in Chris Spielman. You know, he was making a lot of money just working one day a week for Fox. You bring him in, pluck him out of the TV booth, and, and kind of have him help you with the search for GM and coach, help you hire the coach, which I think Chris had a big hand in, uh, and kind of get out of the way. You're right, you, you have to applaud that, you do. Matt Derry with us on the Oakland County Megacast, the host of the Locked On Lions podcast, joining us today on the on the show. So a lot has happened since we last sp spoke to you at that point in time. The Lions were in the thick of their head coaching search, and there were a lot of really good candidates out there in, in this particular uh, coaching carousel with the Lions and a number of other teams looking to fill that head coaching position. 
Lions, of course, settled with Dan Campbell, a, a guy that played for the Li for the Lions, a 10-year veteran of the league, an assistant he assistant head coach under Sean Payton in New Orleans, and has learned from one of the greats. What really sold it for the Lions to hire Dan Campbell as their next head coach when there were other candidates out there that were just as hot of a ticket, like Eric Bieniemy in Kansas City, who's had a couple of really great, a few really great years out there off on the offensive end, and a, a number of other guys that were really being hotly pursued by many teams and seemed to had to have had an interest in the Lions. Well, I think that's a good question, Tyler. I, I think first and foremost, Dan Campbell, number one, wanted to be here uh, badly for some odd reason. He was built. He feels like he's built to come in and turn this pretty poor situation around. And I think he's uh, excited about it. He's been in the building as a former player here. Uh, he knows the city. And I think Chris Spielman looked at this guy and went, oh my God, he's Detroit. He's, you know, this kind of tough, rough and rugged guy that played tight end is not this big household name and uh, might not be the prettiest candidate out there. Um, you know, he's he, he, he chews tobacco. He's got a dip in his mouth. Is that not Detroit a little bit? So, like, I think that, that that helped Campbell's cause. And let's be honest here. Dan Campbell did not have a lot of interviews. There weren't, you know, Philadelphia, Houston, uh, you know, all these other teams looking for coaches. Um, Atlanta, they didn't interview him. So the Lions kind of looked up and said, all right, this, this kind of fits us. Nobody really wants this guy either except us. He wants us. He sold him in the interview about, toughness and culture, which for the last three years, um, the culture has just been horrible in that building. And so Dan Campbell is extremely positive and uh, going to work well with everybody. And that that's, that's a huge first step for this organization because the silos and what was going on inside 222 Republic Drive for the last few years got pretty ugly at times. And I think also having a guy that knows what it is like to be a Detroit Lion, to play for this franchise, to go through those trials, and having that kind of leadership and that experience coming in in a new head right. coaching administration, especially after a very contentious uh, a very contentious few years under Matt Patricia, it, it may also be a big benefit in the locker room. How important is Dan Campbell's experience as a, as a guy who's been there and done that, played in the league fairly recently with his career in, in the NFL, uh, ending in 2009 on the field and immediately going into coaching as an intern for the Dolphins. How does that play in, and, and especially its experience playing for this franchise, to kind of reacclimating the locker room and building that confidence in their coaching staff back up? No, oh, it's huge. Uh, I've had a couple of former uh, 2015 Miami Dolphins on my show on Locked on Lions on the podcast. Um, uh, Dion Sims, who, who many of you guys know from Orchard Lake St. Mary's in yes. Michigan State, um, and, and Jason Fox, who was the right tackle on that 2015 Dolphins team. Dion was the tight end. And both guys played for Dan Campbell. He was the interim coach for 12 games. They went five and seven. Uh, they started that season with Joe Philbin. It got ugly. It was a one and three start. They got blown out in week four. They had a bye week, and Dan took over uh, for the next 12 games. And both guys said, we would run through a wall for this guy. He was intense. But as a former player, it wasn't a lot of bluster and blubber. It, it, it was legit. It was, it, was, it was tough, and he expected a lot out of them, but he was fair. And he knew the days to take him out of pads and kind of give him a break. Um, and, and, and he knew the days to kind of lay off, and he knew the days to, to, to be tough and, uh, and to jump on these guys a little bit. Uh, but they enjoyed playing for him. And I think that the locker room uh, and kind of fixing that a little bit finding some leaders, leaning on them. That's what made Jim Caldwell successful. Now, uh, Jim Caldwell might not have been the best X's and O's guy. We know about his sort of departure from the Lions when they just they couldn't get over the 9-7 and seven hump and they couldn't win a playoff game. They thought Matt Patricia was going to be the next guy to take them over that next hump, and instead it went the opposite way. Now with Dan Campbell, you're giving him a six-year contract. You're giving him time to get it done, uh, and there's going to be some patience there. He'll make some rookie mistakes, but at least those 12 games under his belt, running another franchise and being the head coach, uh, he's got a little bit of experience. And then let's go into the front office, too, because 
as much as Chris Spielman and Barry Sanders played a, a big role in the Lions' decision to bring in Dan Campbell, the front office is, seems to be in connection too with the head with the head coach now as they work into the thick of this rebuild. And on top of bringing in Brad Holmes, who of course was an excellent uh, an excellent guy in the war room for the Los Angeles Rams over the past few years brought in a ton of really talented guys like Todd Gurley and uh, even Jared Goff at the time who we'll talk about in, in a little in a little bit on top of that they brought in a couple of other guys too like Ray Agnew and John Dorsey who have had an, who have had some success particularly drafting and scouting themselves how much of an impact is that bolstering of the front office going to be this early in a rebuild and on top of that with their connection being fairly strong at the onset with the guy in the head coaching position well, you know, I, I think, Tyler, you have to bring in good people. You, you want to have the best of the best in your front office that know talent and can find talent. And Bob Quinn and his staff over the last few years uh, were poor at it, that they didn't do a good job. They drafted poorly. Their free agency, their free agent signings weren't good. And you have pro personnel scouts. If Bob Quinn on a Sunday is at the Lions game. Let's say the Lions are in Green Bay. Bob's on the road trip watching the team. Bob is in the in the general manager suite or, or wherever they put them. But he has pro personnel scouts that they sprinkle around other stadiums to watch other players play. They have their list. They know who the free agents are going to be. And they watch guys with the binoculars in the press box. You see pro personnel scouts from other teams at the Ford Field press box when we were allowed there um, all, all the time. Um, and so those scouts failed and the college scouts failed. So now you're, 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 you're brooming those guys out. And you're bringing in guys like you mentioned, John Dorsey, who is highly respected around the league, drafted Patrick Mahomes when he was in Kansas City, drafted Baker Mayfield when he was in Cleveland, Ray Agnew, a, a pro personnel guy and a, a, a scout for the Rams, an assistant general manager type who uh, really knows talent, played in the league for 10 plus years uh, and was with the Rams when they drafted and they signed players. And so those guys are going to be out looking around and and, and helping Brad Holmes make decisions on players. That's that's what you have to do. You've got to build a good staff. And I think the coaching staff, um, so far from what I've seen, um, is solid. you got a really good offensive coordinator in Anthony Lynn, a, a defensive coordinator that is highly respected around the league, and Aaron Glenn, guys that played in the league, um, guys that can coach up this, this, these players. And so you just you want to have that support system. It's not just about the coach and GM. you got to have good people around you and uh, good talent evaluators. And the Lions don't have enough talent right now. So it's up to this group to, to get to get them more talent. Yeah, that base is certainly there with some, with some talented young guys. TJ Hawkinson, a pro bowler this year. Carry on Johnson in the, in the backfield um, as well. And you know, ha having young people on the team that are going to be impact players going forward and then having talent evaluators in the front office that can put the right guys in the offensive line to open up holes for DeAndre Swift and carry on Johnson to having a guy like Dan Campbell, who's a longtime veteran of the league and excellent, uh, an excellent tight ends coach, be able to even further bolster the talent, the talent and the potential of TJ Hawkinson is important, but you have to be able to put other guys around them to create a complete team. Because as we've seen in the past with successful, relatively successful Lions teams, it seemed to have been when the offense is on, the defense is off. When the defense is on, the offense can't get a, can't get a touchdown, can't score points, and can't win games. So hopefully that is something that's looking up for these Detroit Lions. Let's move on to the action of the rebuild. A couple of weeks ago, big news came across uh, in, the, in the evening where it was uh, finally released that the Lions and Matt Stafford were mutually agreeing to part ways. They were exploring trade options. And then last weekend, the news broke on Sunday night that the Lions had decided to trade Matthew Stafford to the Los Angeles Rams. And boy, did they get a haul back in return. Uh, two future first round picks, a third round pick, and a former number one overall pick in Jared Goff exchanging quarterbacks with the Los Angeles Rams. Let's talk a little bit about that, de about that deal. And let's start with, with bringing in a guy in Jared Goff because it's a young quarterback, only 26 years old. He's been to a Super Bowl, had a couple of years of struggle, but coming into Detroit at, in the wake of that trade, he seems to have a little bit of a restored confidence and sometimes a change of scenery can be big. On that note, with this being a full rebuild and having the quarterback talent in this in this draft and the talent evaluators in the front office, do you believe that Jared Goff is the quarterback of the future or a stopgap measure 
for the Lions, or maybe a little bit of both, and they're just t trying to test the waters out as they begin this rebuild? Um, you know, I, I don't know if they know, and I don't know if Goff knows. Um, this is a two-year, um, you know, look at Jared Goff. This is a two-year audition because after 2022, you can cut him and it won't cost you a dime. And so his contract is structured that way. There are other contracts the Lions have, like Trey Flowers, they can't do that. Right. But with Jared Goff's contract and the way it is structured and the way it is built around the salary cap, after two years, you can get out of it and it will cost you zero. So for the next two years, you have an opportunity now to take a look and see what you have in Jared Goff. I think Brad Holmes, the general manager, Ray Agnew, the assistant GM, both coming from L.A., like him. This was a Jared Goff divorce with Sean McVay, the head coach. I mean, it just so happened that Saturday night Stafford gets traded to the Rams, then an hour and a half later, he and McVay and the wives are breaking bread in Cabo and having dinner and drinks. I mean, give me a break. The, the, <laughs> I'm not saying tampering took place here, but my goodness, this was Sean McVay's first choice. This was Matthew Stafford's first choice. And I'll correct one thing you said earlier, uh, Tyler, mutual decision. I don't think the Lions wanted to trade him. I think the, the Ford family especially loved this guy. He's like a son to them. Uh, you know, Kelly had their fourth child this year, and there were pictures on Instagram of Martha Firestone Ford, the former owner, holding the baby. I mean, there was a it's family right there. But I think Matthew going to them right after the season and saying, guys, I've been here 12 years. I love you. Thanks for everything. Get me out of here. Um, I think at first the Lions were like, are we going to let him leave? We don't have to. I mean, he's got two more years left. He, he signed a contract to play for us for two more years. But I think as time wore on, um, I think they the, the Lions felt that it was the right thing to do for him and for them too. Um, Goff, we'll see. I, I don't – the last couple of years, Tyler, uh, he's not played well. He's regressed. But he's getting a new start. He's going to be working with Mark Brunel, the quarterback's coach, Anthony Lynn who did a great job with Justin Herbert this year with the Chargers. So I, I think they're going to hand him the keys for the next couple of years. But to sit here and say, oh, he's the quarterback for the next five years, I don't know that yet. Yeah, I think it's a worthy test. Having guys, like you said, Anthony Lynn, who's done, who did an amazing job this past year with Justin Herbert in Los Angeles with the Chargers and having a Pro Bowl quarterback and Mark Burnell back there. And then on top of that, the offense that Dan Campbell's going to run, he, it, it seems like he, he's going to want to be a little more play action and run heavy, which – also suits Jared Goff's style of play. So hopefully that is something that can restore confidence in Jared Goff and maybe we struck gold in addition to those extra assets that were acquired. And let's talk about those extra assets because it's very, it's very seldom that you're going to see a trade in any sport that seems to be a win for both, for both teams. The Rams clearly have shown in the last few years they don't value draft assets. They want to bring in talent and win now, and they're going all in. And whenever they can go all in with this current roster and this current team, they want to go all in. On the other side, the Lions need to bring in draft assets. They have great talent evaluators, as we've already spoken on. Having more draft capital can only be helpful in trying to rebuild a team and trying to minimize the cap hit as well. How big, how big of an impact did the additional assets that the Rams were willing to give to the Lions, how big of an impact did that have on the Lions pulling the trigger on that deal as opposed to other teams that definitely in some cases, and, or maybe in other cases, would not have given up nearly as much of a haul, including two first-round picks? That's the key right there. You know, you're talking about two first-rounders. Um, you know, I've, I've been talking to a lot of people around the league and people that I know here, both inside and outside of the uh, Allen Park facility, the Lions were not offered two first round picks by anybody else. Carolina was offering number eight this year. Um, and I was told Teddy Bridgewater as well. Um, that sounds like second place. That sounds like, hmm, maybe, maybe might not be bad. We can get Teddy in here, see if we can resurrect him. If not, we, we, we dump him. We can still draft a quarterback at seven or at eight and have that person stashed away for the future, like Justin Fields or Trey Lance or somebody like that. But I think the Lions looking up and saying, let's send Matthew where he wants to go. His first choice, Los Angeles, let's not alienate him. Because quite honestly, they alienated Barry on his way out of town and Calvin Johnson. So that was in play. You get two first round picks. I know not they're not this year, but 22 and 23. There's no guarantee that the Rams are all of a sudden going to be going to the Super Bowl. 
What if Stafford gets hurt? What if Aaron Donald gets hurt? The Rams are way over the salary cap right now. So let's say the Rams have a season that they don't expect to have and finish seven and nine. Boy, that first round pick in 2022 looks a lot better than it would have if they finished 12 and four. That could happen. It's the NFL. So getting two first rounders, getting a third rounder this year. So now they have six picks instead of five, which they needed. Um, that looked like the best deal to me. And a deal again, that means that because those two first rounders are 22 and 23, uh, 20, 2022 and 2023, this is going to be a longer rebuild, but that's okay. In the NFL, there's no such thing as a five-year rebuild. Now, two, three years, as opposed to just saying, well, we'll rebuild on the fly, and then you retool for one year. This thing, if the for next two years they stink, but in year three of Holmes and Campbell, they're a legit contender, I'm all in. Yeah, you want to be, build a team that can have l- – their success have some longevity to it and be a consistent contender win games get into the playoffs win playoff games and play consistently good football and you got to be able to do that gradually and bring in the right guys and develop the right guys and young talent in today's nfl well, we're joined by matt Derry, host of the locked on lions podcast here on the oakland county megacast all throughout the local area just another few minutes with you uh, matt before we'll let you go um what are your thoughts? We, we've seen in recent weeks uh, with the with legal sports betting coming into to play here in the state of, of Michigan, uh, a lot of engagement already from the sports community, more people, I, th- I think, than even before being engaged and really paying attention to the to the numbers and wanting to get to get in on sports betting and being more in, and being more involved in watching their teams play. What kind of what, what are your thoughts on? online sports betting and its impact on Detroit sports and the Detroit fan base. You know, um, I have some thoughts. Uh, not all of them people will agree with, but here I go. Number one, I'm, I'm already sick and tired of it. I, I don't need to be on Twitter all day seeing what certain people's bets are for the day. No, thanks. I don't care that you have the Indiana Pacers plus eight against the Bucks in a parlay. So I'm a little over I'm already sick of it. With that being said, I get it. Uh, let's look at Detroit for a second. You know, here, here's Ronnie Dahl, all right? Her husband, the legendary Woody Woodruff, comes home uh, every night from Fox 2. Hey, what's going on in Detroit sports, Woody? What'd you do today? Woody has to cover the Red Wings, who are terrible, the Pistons, who are bad, the Lions, who are rebuilding and now will stink, and the Tigers, who have been bad for a while, and I don't know what they're doing. Those are your four... <laughs> they're all bad. Mm-hmm. So like Tyler, if, if you can get excited because you have a little bit of money down and it's legal now. And again, I'm not telling you guys to bet your life savings away, but it, watching the Red Wings is a really tough watch. I turned it on yesterday. They were down three, nothing in the first five seconds of the game. So like, maybe you put a bet down, like here's my, here's uh Darren Helm. I'm going to bet that he scores a goal today and you have some money down. That gives you some interest in watching the game because, quite honestly, the team itself, and I hate to pick on them, they're unwatchable. So so to go, we're going to legalize sports betting. There's going to be a lot of different options. There are going to be casinos and sports sports books in Detroit. And once the the, the pandemic is done, we can go downtown and it can be an entertainment night. That I get. But you asked the question for what does it mean for us? It, It might just get us more interested because the teams right now, this is a struggle. I mean, even look at Michigan State basketball. They're bad. Like, Tom, they're never bad. Like Tom Izzo has good teams every year. Even they stink. So, man, it's it's a tough time. But sports betting, if it can get people interested, I, I guess that would that, that would be a good thing. Yeah. Definitely. So, Matt, I'm going to jump in here for a second because when you mentioned uh, about it, when sports people have to cover these terrible teams, so when I was with ATF, I had the um, offer to move to Chicago and cover that field division. And I said, Woody, I go, let's move. Aren't you tired of, <laughs> of covering these crappy teams? Because people don't understand, like, when win or lose, you have to go into that pre-COVID. You have to go into that locker room, right? right and for Woody, right. you have to do a game show with the Alliance player, and I they stink. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, Hey, can you have a fun little game show with me? And right. that spills over into your day-to-day life as well. Uh, you know, because what you get to cover as a team, and when you have every single team that stinks, 
<laughs> that yeah. impacts your life because you're covering that, but it's also the reaction to the team as well and, and, and the accessibility that you have to them. But also when you have to try to do these fun, uplifted stories, they're yeah. not so down with that, you know? So, no, no. But and, I, and I, obviously I didn't uh, convince him to move to Chicago. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> and uh, I'm doing no, public access TV. <laughs> I love it. Hey, it's all good. It's, um, you know, for, for, for people like Woody and, and Jennifer Hammond and, and, and certainly Dan Miller, Greg Canner behind the scenes have been at Fox 2 for so long and have done such a great job. To me, they're, they're the class of, of Detroit sports when it comes to coverage on television. That crew's been there a while, but you're right. It's like, at least they've been through some good times, you know, and, 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 and some Stanley Cups and some NBA championships with the Pistons and certainly the Tigers going to the World Series. Uh, you know, the Lions have always been the, you know, Fox 2's always sort of been the home of the Lions because the, the NFC games are on Fox and certainly Dan is the voice of the team on the radio. But yeah, it's been, it's been rough the last few years. To be honest, Chicago, you know, uh, you know, the Bulls have been bad. The Blackhawks all of a sudden aren't any good. The Bears aren't good. Uh, you know, the Cubs won, unfortunately, a few years ago uh, against my Indians. You see my Indians flag in the background. But, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's rough. It is rough right now. Um, for sure, for guys like for Woody and for Jen and, and for them to have to cover this stuff. Uh, hopefully better times ahead, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, fing fingers crossed. We really, really hope that our Detroit teams can, at least one of them, let's get one of them back there. And I, I think we're a, a couple years away at the very least from having some optimism there. But uh, we'll get back there. And until, the, and until then, you know, we'll find other interests in sports that keep us engaged and continue to yell at our teams as we, as we do during the down times and encourage them further to improve their teams. Matt Derry, host of the Lockdown Lions podcast. Uh, for those listening that want to tune into your podcast and, and hear more about what's going on with the Detroit Lions, where can they listen to the Locked On Lions podcast? Oh, thanks, uh, Tyler and Ronnie for having me on. Um, and Larry, too. I, You can find us on an Apple podcast, Google podcast, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. You just type in Locked On Lions. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Derry, D-E-R-Y Speaks. Um, it's also posted on the Matt Derry uh, Facebook fan page. Um, so that's that's where I'm at. I do the Pistons official podcast as well. Today, I'm going to be talking to Sam Mitchell, the former NBA head coach, uh, who's now with NBA TV and NBA radio on Sirius about the team. And so I'm doing that as well. And um, I love being on with you guys. Appreciate the time. Well, thank you for being with us. We do enjoy it. Matt Derry, host of the Locked On Lions podcast, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back with more. You're listening to the Megacast on 89.3 Lakes FM, Civic Center TV, and our family of TV and radio stations. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Great to have you with us here on the Mega, <clears throat> Mega Cast. Uh, sorry, I have a frog in my throat because I've been sitting here for a while. I've been drinking a ton of water, though, so I don't understand. Uh, but I have not had any coffee or tea this morning. I'm trying to do 
hot lemon water instead of my usual a uh, caffeine fix so maybe that's uh, the issue but hey we're great to uh very grateful to um bring in our next guest dr An uh, anupam asule he's with saint joe's mercy health system Doctor, you just wrapped up a, a very interesting study because we've been hearing a lot during COVID-19 about the racial disparities when it comes to COVID-19. You did a study. Tell us about the study and what was the outcome of the study as well? Absolutely. Ronnie, thank you for having me on your show to talk to your uh, viewers. So. As all of us have been watching in the media, there have been reports that COVID-19 affects people of different races differently. There were reports that African-American patients are getting more sicker with COVID compared to their Caucasian counterparts. So that was one of the things we wanted to study. Is it the genetics? Does it have something to do with the genetics of a particular race that it's affecting them more severely? Or is it due to disparate access to care, which is what we are seeing? So that's what we wanted to study. The way we did it is we started with about 800 patients all across Michigan, and uh, we looked at them by race, and we did find out that it is true. So African American patients are overrepresented about seven times more often in the hospitalized COVID patients. But once they are hospitalized, and we provide similar level of care to all the patients, the outcomes are similar. African-American patients do not get sicker. They do not have more mortality when we provide equivalent care. So that led us to the conclusion that what we are seeing today, this disparity in the increased hospitalization of African-American patients is due to the disparity in access to healthcare, socioeconomic disparities. And that is a manifestation of that and not likely due to any significant genetic differences. And so it really does come full circle, this conversation. And Dr. Suli, we, because we heard a lot about this at the beginning of the pandemic, but we really haven't heard anything uh, recently because it's been pretty much good, you know, concluded. It, it, a lot of this has to do with lifestyle and how people are living and also access. So if we're, we're still in the middle of this pandemic, if, but if I'm listening to this and I know what could be the underlying cause, are there some uh, lifestyle changes that an individual can take right now to make themselves not such a victim of COVID-19? Absolutely. So from a lifestyle standpoint, one of the things we found out was that the African-American population was presenting later to the ER to receive care. So after symptom onset, they would wait longer before they came to the hospital. So that's one thing that needs to be addressed is that if you develop symptoms such as you have COVID and you are getting sicker, then you should not wait too long to seek out care. You should definitely reach out to your primary care physician at the earliest opportunity so that they can risk triage you and tell you what is the next uh, appropriate site of care and what is the care that will be of benefit to you. The second thing that we observed was what are the risk factors that are greater in the African American community. And we saw that obesity and diabetes were two of the risk factors which were playing a significant role in deciding who was getting sicker, who was getting hospitalized. So especially with uh, respect to obesity and diabetes, both of them tie into social disparities with access to good nutrition. So from that standpoint, what you asked me was from a lifestyle standpoint, what is it that people can do differently? And that comes back to having a healthy, nutritious diet and getting some good exercise, ensuring that your other comorbidities are well controlled. If your body weight is uh, well controlled, if your uh, sugar levels are well controlled, that decreases the chances of you having to be hospitalized with a more significant infection. And, well, and, and exercise is something that we all can do. Uh, if it's just get out and, and walk around your neighborhood or do some of these simple things because there are so many exercise programs, um, you can do it in your own home. But when we're talking about a nutritious diet, for people that are uh, low income, it's hard for them because when you're looking at canned foods or fast food, 
that can last longer or be cheaper than nutritious food. You are absolutely right, Ronnie. And that has been a problem for many, many, many years for all health systems, that foods that are cheap tend to be high in fat, salt, and calories. And uh, one of the things that we at Sunjo's are trying to do to address that issue is we are starting our own uh, community farm here so that we will be able to take some of that healthy food out into the community. One of the things with social disparities is it's fine to say this should be done, but we as healthcare providers have to take a more active role and try to ensure that we go out into the communities to provide the support that is needed by our communities. I love that you're doing that because a lot of it too is not only access, but education. Absolutely, you're right, Ronnie. Education is something that we need to constantly work on and our outreach programs uh, are more and more important. So with that, what do you do with this knowledge once the um, study is finished? Because <clears throat> we had pretty much recognized some of these disparities early on in the pandemic. We're 10 months plus on and you're coming out with the findings, but what do you do with this information? What's next? Wonderful question. Any study is just as good as what can be done about it to make changes. So one of the things we are doing to take this study further is we have established a consortium in Southeast Michigan where Beaumont Health System, Henry Ford Health System, and uh, Wayne State DMC have joined with us and all of us together have started to share our data, our learning, our experiences. So all of us can learn from each other and find out what is working for one health system and pass on the learnings to the other so all of us can learn. Our study in particular has thrown a spotlight on how much more needs to be done with us reaching out into the communities. Case in point being vaccinations. All of us are trying to ramp up the vaccinations uh, all across Michigan. But uh, what we need to do is uh, start working on various ideas, projects of how do we get out there into the community, educate the community and make sure vaccinations are available to everyone uh, regardless of their access to care. I, I love that you just brought up that issue because I think the next focus in this pandemic, while we're still in the midst of it, uh, everyone's looking at the um, vaccine as being the way out of the pandemic. But on the other side, just like there were issues with racial disparities with getting COVID and the testing, I think we're going to see that with the vaccine as well. Can you expand on that and your uh, ex expertise as a medical doctor? And after you did the study, do you have concerns that there are going to be disparities with who gets the vaccine and who doesn't get the vaccine, at least in these early stages? Absolutely. So this endeavor that is being undertaken right now, providing vaccines during a pandemic is one of the biggest public health challenges any country or any society has ever faced. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a big uphill task from up here. All of us are trying to learn as we go about how do we get the vaccines to the people who need them. And there are two aspects to it. One, as you correctly pointed out, is the education. How do we build the trust in the population that these vaccines are safe, they're effective, and that is an ongoing process. That's happening at a national level, that's happening at a state level, that's happening at a local level. These are conversations that all of us are having with our patients, our colleagues, our friends. We are setting the example. Many of the healthcare workers went ahead, took the vaccine, so we could assure our friends and families that it is safe, it is the right thing to do. So that's on the education side of things. The other, as you mentioned, is the logistics. And that is something that all of us are still trying to figure out. How do we reach out to those communities who are of who have the greatest need of these vaccines and ensure that we are able to deliver the vaccines to them? In Dr. Sully, it like I worry about uh, some of the people that don't have internet access. I know so many people that are older and they don't have internet, they don't want to learn it either. And so many of these appointments are like you have to do it online and uh, it's like the disparity. 
And you wonder too, are some of our most vulnerable population not getting not only the vaccination, but the testing as well, because this does require going outside of your home. So you bring up such a great um, a question about how it's going to be distributed and do we need to try to reach some of these individuals in a different way? You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, it's a, the digital divide is one of the biggest disparity we'll see in the near future as more and more health services move to a digital platform. And uh, we at St. Joe's started with multiple different ways that people were able to schedule their vaccinations, recognizing that what you said is a harsh reality that everyone is not as comfortable with online scheduling. We did not use only online scheduling, but we had made paper based and telephone based scheduling as well available so that everyone could reach out by their preferred way and schedule an appointment for themselves. Uh, you're listening to 89.3 WBL, Dior Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. Uh, Dr. Suley, before we let you go, uh, what is the future, do you think? Like, are we on the back end of this pandemic or are we still navigating the middle of it? Uh, so this is something which we actually can control how things move ahead. It's all up to us. If we are able to get the vaccines out, if people are able to keep using their masks and keep maintaining some social distancing practices, and it's always a balance between uh, having our economy, our jobs, and our society be functional while taking care of all the healthcare needs. If we are able to continue maintaining that balance, then we'll be able to do well with controlling the pandemic. Our number vaccinated will reach a threshold where we will be able to get the pandemic under control. If we are not able to stick with some of the basic uh, precautions we have been taking, then we ourselves will be responsible for the pandemic going into a, another wave locally. Dr. Suli with us here on the St. Joe's, he's from the St. Joe's Mercy Health System. Uh, good doc, before we let you go, uh, what, anything that maybe we didn't touch on that you want our listeners and our viewers to know, because you have such a, much more knowledge about this virus than what we do. Absolutely. Um, what I just touched on is what I would like to say. One, make sure you take care of your general health, uh, continue to work with your primary care physicians. The better you control your other diseases, the better your body will have a chance of fighting back against COVID. As and when you are able to get a vaccine, please go ahead and get a vaccine. Millions of people have received the vaccine. It is safe and effective. I myself and my family have received the vaccine. And uh, I would strongly encourage you to go ahead and get vaccinated as and when possible. Continue to maintain your social distancing, masking, and other safety precautions to take care of not just yourself, but other people who are more vulnerable who you come in contact with. And I will, like Dr. Suley, I know we're supposed to be socially distant right now, but I just like, I'm a hugger. I miss people. <laughs> and I know like, yeah. you know, and it's that like when you go in and you're under a mask, I want to hold up a sign that says, no, I'm smiling at you today. <laughs> I know it's difficult, something all of us have to live with, hopefully for shorter than longer. Maybe some short-term pain will be long-term gains. Well, Dr. Sully, we so appreciate your time, but also your expertise and your knowledge and your dedication uh, to the public as we all continue to navigate this pandemic. And let's hope we don't go through another one for another hundred years, right? Thank you, Rodi. I hope so too. Thank you, Dr. Soli. He is with St. Joe's Mercy Health System. He was part of a, a very important uh, study about the racial uh, disparities in COVID-19 and uh, the underlying conditions that help uh, contribute to some of the severe cases of COVID-19. So thank you, uh, Dr. We so appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break here on the MegaCast, running a little bit uh, behind, but when we come back, we'll be joined with Marty Nolenberg. He's the co-owner of a Sedona Tap House Restaurants. This is the Oakland County MegaCast. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. 
It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash mibridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. After 11 o'clock here on the Thursday edition of the Megacast, we want to say thank you for tuning in. And just as a quick reminder, for those who may not know, you can always catch previous episodes of the Megacast on civiccentertv.com. You can click on for the full Megacast, or if you go to the on-demand uh, section, you can also get the individual interviews. I have a lot of people asking me about that. That is the best way to do so. And and with that, though, we want to continue the uh, second hour of the Megacast. And with us now is going to be Marty Nolenberg. He is the co-owner of the Sedona Tap House Restaurants, but also you are a former estate senator. I believe that's where I knew you. Uh, thank you for being with us here on the Megacast. Happy to be here and uh, honored to, to help. Uh, what a crazy time like you I believe you started the first one uh, Sedona at uh, 2017 in Troy then you opened up the second location in Novi in 2019 and then the pandemic hits <laughs> so how is it going uh, for you and your company right now I mean it's, it's been challenging I mean obviously um, you know being forced to shut down and then trying to figure out how to reopen in a safe way and then to be shut down a second time. Obviously that was really devastating to us and uh, certainly unexpected for us to see that happen. I knew that the numbers were going up and, and I knew that you know mitigation efforts uh, needed to occur, but I never envisioned a shutdown. And, and when you shut down, it's, it's devastating on our employees, especially before the holidays and our business does not survive without our employees and to have to tell them that they'll let go a month, month and a half before the holiday season when that's when they make the most money of all the 12 months. I and mean, that's the busiest time of year for restaurants. They rely on that money to support their families and, and the kids and, and to see them, you know, have to file for unemployment um, is devastating to them. And, and to me, you know, I can't run a business without them. And so it hurts when I have to tell them that, that bad news. And so, um, but we're, we're, you know, obviously we're back up, you know, we're, we're now four days into this thing and um, they're excited, they're motivated to be back and they wanna work. And, and we've been very blessed and fortunate that we've got great employees that are ready to work. And, and, and um, you know, we put in a, a number of social uh, safety measures Every employee that enters our place has to do a temperature check. We uh, do a health screening uh, check with them as well. And if they are feeling feverish or feeling ill, we advise them to not even come in at all because we don't want them to hurt, uh, harm um, the other employees and uh, obviously the, our guests as well. And so we've got a number of safety mechanisms in that regard, obviously, the tables are spread out. We have, you know, room dividers all over the place. We have, um, you know, single source condiments. Um, we have uh, throwaway menus. We have digital menus. Um, you know, we sanitize clean. Um, so we've had a number of meetings with our employees on the importance of safety and health, and not only for themselves, but also for our guests as well. 
I, and we talk about this as well, um, because in the beginning, uh, like back in November, a three week pause, which turned into almost a three months. And when people say, oh, well, you can get unemployment, let's just be clear what so many of these people were collecting on unemployment doesn't even come near to what they were making um, in a day or even a week uh, of being in a restaurant because you're relying on the tips as well. So we've had um, a local bartender here on our show as well. And you see the devastation that they go through uh, when you close down because carry out doesn't sustain some businesses and some of these restaurants have had to close down because their carry out business didn't support their business model. Um, but when you go forward, do you anticipate because we're reopening, but we're also reopening uh, just before the Super Bowl, which I'm really surprised that she did. I thought she would have waited until after the Super Bowl. Um, but also when we're reopening after the Super Bowl, do you anticipate if the numbers continue to rise that we're going to see another complete shutdown again? Or do you think the curfew is going to be kind of the standard that we go forward from here on out? I mean, Monty, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I, I haven't been able to, you know, figure the mindset of this governor from day one. And, and, and I guess, you know, my, my frustration is when, with the second shutdown back in November, you know, we were told three weeks. And we were hopeful that it would just be three weeks. And then in, in December, we were told it was another three more weeks and in January, another three more weeks. And so you're on pins and needles all the time. And, you know, I would argue that her metrics don't really support her efforts. 47 other states have been open in some way, shape, or form for quite a while now. And Michigan's sort of the outlier in all of this. Um, and, you know, the, the, the most recent shutdown, why, why, why 10 p.m.? Why 25%? Why not 31%? You know, why not 11 p.m.? I mean, where is the supporting data that says that you know, it's 25%. There isn't any. It's just an arbitrary decision that she has made. And I get that she's trying to be safe, you know, but there's got to be balance. And I don't see the balance in any of her, her actions. And it's devastating. We talked about the bartender you mentioned. It's not just the, the pay. It's, it's the mental, you know, anguish that goes on as well because you're not employed. You're sitting home. You want to work. You, you get stir crazy. And for a lot of our employees, they have families, and you know they um, have kids, and so they're they're at home. They're trying to juggle their family life with their kids. Um, that's that's challenging, and they're not getting paid. So it's it, it's it's not just paid. It, it's all of these things coming coming together, and um, that's frustrating for them. And so I I, I can't predict what's next. I, I would just say that you can't stop commerce. I mean, we've we've had commerce since the Stone Ages before Christ. And, you know, we had a bartering system. And so when you stop the flow of commerce and the hospitality industry is just as hospitable and I can live with, I just want to know the rules. Give me a set of rules. I, I, I laid out what we're doing to keep the place clean and safe for our employees. If there's something else that we need to do, I think my restaurant and, and everybody in the restaurant industry are willing to take additional measures. We just need to know what they are. If, 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 if uh, we had those, if we need to do those, we would do those. But right now we're utilizing every tool in the toolbox that keeps us safe based on what, you know, experts have told us to do. Uh, Marty Nolenberg with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the co-owner of a Sedona Tap House Restaurants. And Marty, just in full disclosure, people should know that I do work part-time or it's like a pickup a, a one day a week. I typically would work at our local neighborhood a restaurant bar. And I did it because I'm working on a project on the sidelines about uh, frontliners on COVID-19 and how really uh, as the different phases of this pandemic go through our society, we're kind of lost, right? So I wanted to be on the front lines to see what they were experiencing, but also to talk to people that are in these industries and to see what they're experiencing. And I will tell you, um, I miss that job. Like I miss like meeting new people and meeting like the salt of the earth people that make our community thrive and the hearing their stories. And so I'm excited. I haven't gone back to work yet, but I will be soon. Um, but 
you know, so just in full disclosure, obviously I see a different side of this as well. And I really did it just for this project I'm working on for the media, but you see the mental side of this as well. And I don't think people are really kind of taking that mental side into consideration because I feel like if people come out to eat in a restaurant, they know the risk and they're willing to take the risk. Um, because we all know that local restaurants, you, we get outbreaks, but you can't say where an outbreak starts as well. And it's so hard because um, we want to get back to where we were, but how do we get back there? Uh, but you have such an interesting side to this because you also were an elected leader at some point in time. So what are your thoughts on this and the government side to the response to this pandemic? I mean, I think, you know, unfortunately, there's um, absolute stalemate. I, I, my biggest concern with what's happening in Lansing is the fact that there's no legislative um, involvement at all. And, and if I were, and obviously I was a Republican lawmaker, but if I were a Democratic lawmaker, you know, I'd want to be on political record as having voted for, you know, uh, the governor's initiatives. And so they, 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 they aren't on public record because there's no voting occurring. And the governor has taken this uh, initiative and, um, you know, it's all by herself. And she's gone solo in this in the entire effort. And so uh, the lawmakers I, I speak to, they, they want to be involved. They, they want to be able to have a voice and a say. And, and there doesn't seem to be that interaction. And so you want to debate some of these issues. You know, there's no debating on these issues. There's no votes on these issues. And it's frustrating. Um, it would be frustrating for me if I were there that, you know, you spend all this time meeting with your constituents, you know, trying to get yourself elected, and then you go up to Lansing and then you don't really, aren't able to vote on anything. And, and, and I've been in the minority and that's not fun, obviously, but you still have a voice. When you're in the minority, you can vote against or sometimes you vote with, you know, the, uh, the opposite party. And, and so there's none of that going on. So I feel bad for the lawmakers that are up there that don't have a voice. And, and I put the blame on the governor in this case because she's not allowed um, them to have a vote. She, she's ruling through her executive orders. And let's face it, the health department's orders, that, those are her orders. I mean, she's the boss. The health department's working for the governor. And, you know, it's a smoke screen. And, and I think people need to realize that, you know, if you like, you know, the shutdowns and, and the policies, it's on her. If you don't, it's on her. And if you're a lawmaker, um, you can't blame the lawmaker because they, they really have no say. Yeah, I, uh, we will. Uh, let's just be clear. Politics are at play here. So even though she lost her executive power position um, back in October, when it comes from the health department, it's coming from her. Absolutely. And you also wonder, uh, it, could that have had something to do with Gordon leaving his position, um, that is still yet to be determined. But I love your uh, viewpoint on this because you do see both sides of the coin as well. And so I should just mention, it just came across the wires that the governor is expected to give us an update today at 1.30 this afternoon. My guess, a lot of that is going to have to center around the issue of students wanting that, that in high school sports and the huge pushback that's going on right now. My guess you might lessen <laughs> uh, some of those rules and regulations, but getting back to where uh, you are and your business, how long do you think that your company, even at 25%, is that enough to really be able to sustain being open right now? You know, it, it, our restaurant, we obviously um, do better on the weekends. And, and so, you know, we're going to take a big hit on the weekend because we just cannot get a number of people in uh, those time slots. And so for a lot of restaurant owners, they, they can make a third to half of their income on a weekend. And so if not more, um, I guess time will tell, um, you know, so far we've been open three days and it, it's been pretty good. I'll, I'll take it. And, um, you know, we're down obviously over a uh, prior year, but it does a couple things for us. One, it obviously allows us to bring our employees back into the fold. It uh, creates excitement for them. Um, it also energizes them, uh, creates energy within the restaurant. So I'm happy that we're able to bring those folks back. 
it also allows them to you know keep up with their skills and and this slow pace will allow them to kind of fine tune the time that they were gone for uh, I, I think from a guest experience i think our guests are understanding look everybody knew that we were closed for months and months everybody now knows that we were open february 1st so there's a lot of pent up demand for our guests mm -hmm. to want to be out and and they understand the rule they understand they're not our rule but the rules that we have to follow and and so far they they're 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 you know abiding by the protocols that we have in place and so um i think it's a start ronnie i i don't it's, it's not going to get us where we need to get to um you know i i i we cannot really afford to go backwards because every time you shut down you got to lay people off when you bring them back you have to retrain them you have food that goes to spoilage it's you know, for instance, we advertised back in October for our December holiday season. That's what that money was wasted. We couldn't even use it. And so, you know, we just can't, you know, if she's going to tell us to shut down, then tell us, tell me six months from now. And, and I doubt if she would do that. But we, we need that sense of certainty, you know, for all of the above uh, reasons. And um, time will tell. I mean, this is a good start. Um, you know, I should just back up a bit, you know, the when she shut it down back in November, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty with, you know, the definition of outdoor seating. And, you know, you had a number of tents and igloos and the whole theme, thing seemed kind of silly. We didn't know how long this thing was going to last. And so, you know, the tent thing, they kept changing the rules there. You had to have two opposing sides open. The tables had to be within eight feet of the, you know, opening space. And that didn't come out until well over a month of her initial initiative. So those restaurants that bought tents all of a sudden found themselves that the tent wasn't working in a way that they had hoped. Then there's igloo thing, you know, and I didn't know if that was going to stay or not. And we finally pulled the trigger in our Troy location and, and they've been up for a couple of weeks. I know by location we waited and you know the four week back order, backlog. And so I'm, I'm not expecting to get my igloos till next week. And so as a business owner, you want to know what you're able to do and not able to do. And we've not had that. But, you know, another shutdown would be devastating. I, I just don't know how financially restaurants are expected to handle no no revenue coming in. And as you pointed out, takeout service, I mean, that helps. It keeps people employed, but it really doesn't add to the bottom line. It just keeps people employed and, you know, helps our guests and it pays some bills. But you know, that's not the business model that restaurants got themselves into. Well, and on top of that, too, when you're, uh, you know, they're offering what they, you know, our politicians like to stand in front of the podium and do a press conference to say about these grants that they're offering. But really, when you look into it, number one, the grants aren't even going to be close enough. I think for businesses, 20000 that's grateful for any dollar you could get. But two, it's like by the time you apply and you actually get the money and it's up to a certain percentage, I know the people I work with that applied for the latest grant for the um, restaurant workers, because our uh, place had been closed completely, they've received nothing so far. Um, so, you know, you're looking at your rent and you're looking at your car payment and you're looking at your electric bill and what are you saying? Like, well, the governor said, didn't you see the press conference? He said the money's coming. I applied for it. But, you know, it, it, it makes it harder. And really, at the end of the day, up to $1,600 when you've been out of work for three months, that really does nothing. But, you know, yeah, but it gives them a headline. It gives them a press conference. It's good scraps. And, you know, we, we've applied for some of the state grants and county grants and it, it's appreciative, but it's, it's, you know, it's scraps and, 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 and we're fighting for every dollar we can get and we're trying to cut cost everywhere we can cut. And, you know, it, it's, it's, we're, 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 we're fighting for scraps. I mean, I guess it's, that's, um, we'll take whatever scrap we can get though. So, Marty, um, I have to say, uh, people keep laughing at me. So one of the big issues, of course, with restaurants is you can't wear a mask. And I think the latest uh, recommendation is that you keep your mask on the entire time, except for in between bites, right? Like you take it off, you take a drink, you take it off, you take it. So my sister had um, come up with a mask. Um, and, and so you actually put it on, right? But it has a 
little zip thing. So it's, it's double. So you can keep your mask on the entire time and you can eat and drink. And so she made it, we had them made for our family and stuff. And then um, she was like, people, every time we go out, people are like, where'd you get the mask? Where'd you get the mask? So she started making, making them, but I put them on my Facebook and everyone was laughing. And I was like, no, it's, it's not a joke. It's real. Like, this is the answer right here. Like when the governor says, oh, you can't eat and drink with you. You have to take a mask off. Well, no, I don't have to take my mask off. <laughs> Yeah, solutions. You know, we're, we're about solutions. Uh, well, you know, I, I appreciate that because, <laughs> you know, I don't have all the answers and, you know, we're always looking for better ways of doing things. And, and, and obviously safety is really important now. And, and if there's better ways of doing stuff, we, we want to know about it. And, and so, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of, of keeping our restaurant safe, our patrons safe, you know, our employees safe. And so we're all about safety and you know, we put a lot of, you know, safety uh, efforts in place and, but that's not to say that there's more, that more can't be done. And so we're open to that. And, you know, it's interesting though, that, you know, 47 other states are, are open. And I mentioned this earlier in some way, shape or form. And, 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 you know, it's not perfect. I mean, it's, it's, it, this, this virus isn't going to go away completely by itself. It's going to require, you know, the safety measures and the vaccines that are coming out and, in time and I think eventually you know we'll have a better handle on all this and so I mean yeah I'm, I'm open for all kinds <laughs> of ideas well I can send you a mask <laughs> but with that though I I do have to ask because um so I I'm from Ohio I've been going back to Ohio uh, quite a bit during this and I will say every time I've been back in Ohio before the reopening of our restaurants I was like I just want to go sit down and eat at a restaurant. And I know a lot of people that live on the borders of some of these other states of Indiana, Wisconsin, but you know, Ohio, like in Monroe, that's exactly what they're doing. They're just going over the border. They're right. still doing it. But I also know a lot of friends that have been saying, we're done mentally, they're drained. And the ones that are financially able to do so, they're taking off and they're going to Florida for two, three weeks. Yep. Um, because they can, you know, better weather and you can eat at a restaurant. It's something about the mental part of this. And do you think that plays into it? Like also it's it, it's kind of a backlash on you and your industry here in the state of Michigan, even though you're not making these decisions. I, I, I mean, I guess it's, um, look, people have that choice and, and they're choosing to go to Ohio. They're choosing to go to Indiana. I have a friend that lives in, uh, Chicago and outside of Chicago and in Chicago shut down completely, you know, she, she can work out of her house. And so, you know, she's in Florida for a month and she rented an apartment, a fully furnished apartment an hour from the ocean. But in her mind, it's like, Marty, you know, I, I can get a cup of coffee, you know, and, and, and get it from, you know, around the corner. I can't do that in Chicago. You know, I can have lunch or I could, you know, have, have dinner. And so she made that decision that uh, she was going to go to Florida. She can afford to do it. And, and I think we forget about that. I mean, look, I don't, if you're not feeling safe about going to restaurants, you know, I really don't want you coming into my place. I want you to feel safe. And if you don't feel safe, no, I don't blame you. You know, no offense. You're not hurting my feelings. If you don't feel safe, then you ought not to come into my restaurant or any restaurant until you you know, feel safe to do so. And, 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 and I'm not offended at all. And, 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 you know, you have to do what's best for yourselves, uh, yourself. And, um, and, and hopefully as time goes on, more people will feel more comfortable going out, but there's a lot of pent up demand. Uh, on you. People do want to be out. They do want to socialize. They do want to meet their friends. They want to go out with their family. They, they want to have food served to them as opposed to making it from home. They're tired of you're in a pickup thing. I mean, you have to get in your car, go get it, bring it back. And it's not the same as when you had the meal brought right out to you and it's, it's cold like it should be or it's hot like it should be. You know, when you take it home, you lose some of that, uh, you, know, you know, that effort. And, um, and, and it's people want to experience um, and engage in the restaurant world and, 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 and people want to be out. And so, um, yeah, so for those that um, don't want to go out, then they ought to stay home, and I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. 
You know, and I see that too. Um, we were just having the conversation last night, uh, people like pointing out businesses that, oh, they saw someone without a mask. It was like, well, if you're that uncomfortable, stay home. Um, you know, but I'm with you. Like I miss people. <laughs> I need people. I love my husband. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I do love him, <laughs> but I'm tired of talking about comic books. <laughs> <laughs> and and he knows better to talk about sports with me, Marty. So I'm with you. I need to, I need to talk to people. <laughs> I understand. Well, it's been great having you on, and we always appreciate uh, your perspective on this issue as well. But we do wish you a continual success. Uh, the two locations I've been to the location in Troy. I've not been to the one in Nova yet, but hopefully, uh, no future closures in our future. I agree. I agree. I appreciate you having me. I enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll talk soon. Well, best of luck. And I'm going to put uh, the location on my must go to um, <laughs> places over the week, because also people don't understand. It's just that business relationship. Like, you know, you can meet over a drink now right. or over a coffee. So that's, that's great as well. Zoom right. doesn't do it for me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Marty Nolenberg with us. He is the co-owner for the Sedona Tap House Restaurants. They have the location in Troy, as well as the Novi at 12 Oaks Mall. Always great having you. We're going to take a quick break here on the Mega Cast. And when we come back, we're excited to have with us uh, Ruth Daniels. She's the managing partner for the Maple Theater here on the Mega Cast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the public information officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. taking time out of your day to be with us here on the mega cast uh, as a reminder you can always catch tyler and myself monday through friday 10 a.m until noon civic center tv birmingham area municipal access you can also uh, tune us in channel 15 if you have comcast 99 on at&t if you're out driving around or if you have one of those old school transistor radios in your house you can also tune us in on the radio 89.3 Lakes FM 88.1 FM, the BIF. And we also want to say thank you to the West Bloomfield Township Clerk's Office for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. I know that's a lot, right? But that's what makes us the Megacast, TV, radio, and social media. We try to uh, utilize all platforms to bring you some long form interviews for uh, so that you can be informed on what's happening here in our community as we all continue to navigate the COVID-19 crisis. And with us next is going to be Ruth Daniels joining us on the show. She's the managing partner for the Maple Theater, one of my absolute favorite theaters to go to. Ruth, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. So theaters uh, have been allowed to reopen, but are you reopened yet there at the Maple Theater? Um, yeah, uh, theaters were allowed to reopen a couple of months ago. We didn't reopen because we couldn't have concessions. And so we are now reopening this Friday, tomorrow, um, with concessions because it's allowed again. And also at the same time as we're reopening, we have a new restaurant partner opening in our building, um, Como's Papa, so from Ferndale. That is exciting because that is the one thing that sets your theater apart is that you can have the dining experience along with the theater experience as well. Yeah. So it, 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 and so I feel like you've been double hit <laughs> during this pandemic. So true. It was um, strange because we were about to relaunch the cafe when COVID hit. And um, 
So <laughs> yes, we, it was a double whammy. <laughs> and when we reopened last time for like five weeks, we did not have the restaurant open. So, um, but now uh, the whole place will be open and hopefully people will start to come back. So what was part of the uh, making process in delaying the reopening the second time? Was it the concessions? Because that is really a big part of your bottom line. That's correct. And, and the thing is, is that because we are a, a small theater and our attendance was okay during um, the reopening the first time, but it wasn't great. Part of it is Hollywood because they're not releasing the films and most of the things we are getting are also available VOD, video on demand. So, you know, it was hard to get an audience. And, and the fact is, is that um, my personal opinion, I can tell you, we, we follow the cinema safe guidelines that were established by the National Association of Theater Owners. And I feel theaters are very safe right now. It's the safest time ever <laughs> because there's not a lot of people there um, and your space fine. And, but for me going to a movie, the popcorn is part of the movie experience. It's, it's an experience. It's not just watching a movie. Yeah, because I don't care um, uh, like how I make popcorn at home and never taste as good as it does at the movie theater. I, I, and, I agree and, with you 100%. And it's funny because even though I'm in a theater a lot, I don't eat popcorn all the time. I eat when I go to the movies. <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> it's something about that, like, and it just, it is funny because when I sit at home and I watch a movie, I don't eat popcorn. But when I go to a movie theater, I have to have popcorn. Yes, I agree. It's so funny. So with that, uh, tell us a little bit more about this new relationship that you have with Comos, because you are a different experience. But how does partnership come about and in, in the middle of a pandemic as well? Well, again, um, I, you know, my partners, uh, John and Lauren Goldstein, you know, met with Zach Sklar and the peas and uh, peas and carrots hospitality group, and you know, made the arrangements and and formed this alliance. And um, we're very excited because, from what I understand, Comos had wanted to have a Bloomfield Hills, or a, you know, location in the area, because during the pandemic people go and you know do takeout but it's a little far for takeout when you live in the bloomfield area yeah and that is a good point and you know comos through the years has um it, they went through some challenges the old comos mm -hmm. closed down for a while they were in ferndale at nine mile and woodward and then reopened so okay. this is kind of a good foot in the door with a pop-up there uh in uh our area but on the other side, you can go in and eat and not actually go to a movie at your theater, right? Yes, it, it's been this way now for several years since, um, well, we had a coffee shop and we, okay, when we took over uh, the Maple uh, from Landmark Cinemas in 2012, we had put in the coffee shop. And then in 2015, we put in a restaurant. We, we actually, we had started serving food before, but we actually made it more like a restaurant and then so, so we had, this is our fourth rendition now <laughs> of this. It's a little bit different, but we originally had Great Lakes Coffee and which was very popular too. Um, but you know, so during the years we have changed and, and we're just trying to go with the flow and um, keep it successful. That's the important thing. Oh, well, their pizza is always um, enjoyed, but their menu as well. But um, as you're going into, you had mentioned uh, one of the struggles being coming out of Hollywood and the movies that they're releasing, do you foresee that those are going to get better? Because some of the movies out right now, I'm like, eh, do I really want to spend that extra money to go to the movie theater to see that movie? Right. It's so funny that you say that because I am constantly telling my friends in Hollywood, I need a comedy. I need something happy. I don't want to go and be depressed. I don't want to watch COVID. <laughs> you know? So, um, I'm trying to book it properly, you know, so that everything isn't dull or not necessarily dull, just because, you know, we're just not sad. How's that? How's that? So our first week we're opening tomorrow are movies that have been out for a while. One of them is Promising Young Woman, which I have wanted to see for a long time. Now it is in some movie theaters already and it has been on video on demand. But the thing about it being on video on demand, I mean, it is $20. So 
technically going to a movie is not more expensive <laughs> than watching it on television, unless you have a whole room full of people. And um, it also, this one looks exciting to me, you know, not just a depressing movie. And a lot of art films are depressing anyway through the years, you know, <laughs> because they often don't have happy endings. But anyway, so like that's one I'm looking forward to seeing in a movie theater this week. <laughs> I, I, we all need happiness and comedy right now. Uh, I will say though, when it comes to some of those more artsy films, I need to see them in a theater because if I watch them at home, I fall asleep. I understand. <laughs> but if I go to a movie theater, I'm, I feel like I'm more alert and in tune into the movie experience. Plus I'm like, I'm not wasting that money. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if you're at home, you're like, oh, I can rewatch it again whenever yeah. I want. That's true. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and it, it's it, it's interesting, though, because um, at the beginning of the pandemic, even I was hoping that the writers, I mean, are writing, you know, some comedies and upbeat films, which, of course, wouldn't be made into a film till next year anyway. But I think what's going to happen is more and more states are opening now and letting the movie theaters open. And as they open, I believe that Hollywood will move their schedules again and get more movies to be released. Like next week, we're opening three films that will not be available video on demand at the same time. We'll have them for at least a week or two before they go on video. So that that's good. Um, you know, so, um, and there's nothing like the communal experience at a movie theater. I mean, an action film, uh, a comedy, even a real tearjerker. It's always better when there's other people experiencing it with you, you know, it's a, a, I mean, the great thing about movies though, is we could do it during the whole pandemic at home. And I'm the type of person, I watch movies on a plane, I watch movies on my iPad, I watch, but, but I don't like anything better than watching it in a movie theater. You know? It is very much a different experience. Ruth Daniels with us here on the Mega Cast. She is the managing partner for the Maple Theater. But with that, what do you think is the future of your industry now? Because, because of COVID-19, the industry has been kind of flipped over. And do you think some of the changes are going to be long lasting? You know, my career has been long and I wanna tell you the first time I was interviewed for a, on TV, I was at a discount house, so a dollar house and video had just started, VHS. And um, they had asked me, do I think that video is going to kill the movie theaters? And I hear that goes all the way back to when TV started. But anyway, and I said, no, I'm playing Dirty Dancing on Saturday night and selling it out every week while it's on video. So it's not, you know, people want a shared experience. Where is a, a teenager going to take their date? Um, where, you know, it's, it's the least expensive form of entertainment. And I believe it's coming back. And as far as Hollywood goes with the movies being able to deliver them differently, I feel that they're missing a piece of it right now that they can't get back from theatrical exhibition. And the fact is, if you know, Wonder Woman only opened on movie theater screens, there would have been that $200 million just on movie theater screens, you know, and then they would make their money on demand later. So they want that piece back too. And let's face it, a lot of these movie stars or directors want to direct for the big screen, not necessarily for the small screen. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going away. I think it's just going to take some time for people to feel comfortable again, for the vaccine to kick in, for COVID to go away. And I'm hoping by next Christmas, we start to see people come back to the theaters like they want to. We adapt and we change with the times, exactly. and even in a pandemic. And with that, Ruth, I will say one, you know, I miss those girls movie nights where you got your girlfriends together, you go out to eat, you go buy cupcakes, possibly maybe sneak them in, <laughs> chocolate, I didn't hear you. Uh, <laughs> right? but uh, you can't wait to get back to that. And um, so thank you for what you're doing. So I will say, cause I know you're bringing, you know, Como's in, can you take the pizza to your, um, you know, to um, eat? like I can order a big pie and just sit here and munch on it with me and my friends and pass it up and down? Not necessarily, um, because again, it's still COVID and there's still certain rules that apply. So, um, I mean, our concession stand is open. We have a bar, <laughs> you know, on our side in the theater and they have, you know, so, so, I mean, you can still take your concessions and things like that in and hopefully you'll have eat your, eaten your pizza before <laughs> or after. 
Well, I will say when I come, I'm taking my mask. I was just telling Marty about my mask. Everyone's laughing at me on Facebook about my mask. So my sister came up with these for us. You go to the movie theater or you go wherever, and mm -hmm. then you open it up, and I can eat and drink through my mask. I love it. Right? That's and so cool. I can eat a piece of pizza or my popcorn through my mask. And you just have to go home and wash it after. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do anyway. I mean, we're right. all using contaminated masks by this time like, like that. that's good. from rear view mirrors and people dropping them on the floor picking them up eh. <laughs> true true well it's been great having you and we wish you uh continued success because we need small movie theaters such as yours to survive because you really are um, such a unique venue for us here and uh in the uh, bloomfield hills area we all love it and so um, best of luck to you and your team Thank in the future you. Thank you very much. Okay, so you reopen on Friday. Friday, February 5th. A lot of people looking forward to that. Ruth Daniels, a managing partner over at the Maple Theater at Telegraph and Maple. Go check them out. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we'll continue the discussion around vaccines. This is the Oakland County Megacast. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. to have you with us here on the Thursday edition of the Mega Cast. Uh, always great to have you with us. And just so people know, if maybe you're tuning in for the first time, this show grew out of the COVID-19 crisis. And back in the beginning, we past March uh, last year, Tyler and Dave Scott started the program as a way to be able to bring you information as it continues to change. And more than uh, 10 months later, here we are still continuing the conversation. And with that, we want to go ahead and bring in Ruth Ann Sutterth. She is the Senior Vice President for Public Affairs and Communications with the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Great to have you back with us here on the show, Ruth Ann. Thank you for having me. Appreciate being here. So obviously a lot of the conversation right now is shifting from testing for COVID-19 into the vaccine. Uh, with that, uh, we've been pretty successful in getting the vaccine, but there are still a lot of glitches in the logistics of trying to get the shots in the arms of the individuals that need them. Can you give us an update? Absolutely. Uh, we are excited to have moved into this phase of vaccinating Michiganders against COVID-19. It is, you know, the beginning of the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And, and we started this process in mid-December. And so we're about seven weeks in now. And what we've seen is, um, you know, a, a bumpy start. Uh, and now we are uh, closing in on 1.1 million shots in arms, which is a tremendous accomplishment, um, nearly 10% uh, of our population. And, um, you know, hospitals have administered about 550,000 of those. 
And um, it's been a, a learning curve as we understand what hospitals roles are, how we can work together with local and county health departments to ensure that people understand where to go for their vaccine. Uh, and so far, the limiting factor has really just been supply. Uh, and that's not a unique problem in Michigan. Everyone wants more vaccine. Uh, the faster we can get shots into our state, the faster we can move through our priority groups uh, and make sure that we can uh, get back to normal life here in Michigan. So you do understand the frustration for individuals who are out there trying to make appointments. And plus, you got to keep in mind that a lot of seniors are not online. They're not tech savvy. What advice do you give to people who are trying to sign up for the vaccine? Should they go through their county health department, their local hospital, a health care provider? What is the best route or do they try anything and everything? That's a great question. And, and we understand that um, everyone is anxious to get a, their spot in line when it's their turn. And so there are a different, um, there's a variety of options depending on your comfort level with you know going online. I would say that if you are a person over 65 or in one of the current categories of essential workers that are being offered the vaccine and you have a strong relationship with your local uh, hospital or health department, um, those systems have uh, invited those eligible people to sign up um, either online, but they also have phone systems set up where you can call in, in many cases. Um, so our hospitals are working to ensure that there are access points available for those who may let, be less tech savvy. But uh, I will say that uh, the state is shifting to a model where more vaccine is going to go to health departments than to hospitals. And so checking with your local health department, either on their website uh, or if appropriate via a phone call is another way to do that. Um, at this point, most retail pharmacies like Myers aren't getting vaccine yet. So right now, checking your health department website or your hospital website is going to probably be the first step or, or by calling them. Yeah, but I believe uh, the Biden administration did just announce that pharmacies will start to get those, such as your CVS and your Rite Aids and in your Myers. Uh, when, what is that timeline? Do you know? Uh, we don't know precisely. They just announced that uh, yesterday morning, I believe, and it looks like there's 1 million doses that will go to pharmacies across the whole country. So that's not a ton, and it's a pilot program. So we're waiting to see more about where exactly those vaccines will land. Yeah, so that's a good point. And like a million, when you're looking at the entire country, not very small. So continue to go down the routes and the avenues that we are already uh, suggesting and advising. The big question um, with me and some of our friends too, for the individuals that have already had COVID, should they try to be getting the vaccine? Or if they do fall into the allotment of the people that are eligible right now, if they've already had COVID, should they just wait and, and maybe give that vaccine to someone else? That's a great question. Um, you know, if, if you've had COVID within 90 days, um, you're likely to still have, you know, the stronger immunity. Uh, but if it's been longer than that, your immunity starts to go down. I, you know, that's what we're seeing. And so, um, while, you know, it's, it would be a noble thing to do to give your spot to somebody uh, who hasn't had the virus, um, we, we do want to be sure that if you are in an eligible population that you are signing up for the vaccine and, and not, um, not avoiding that for too long. Again, that 90 day mark can be a helpful benchmark for folks considering that, that very question. I was really surprised to see the mayor of Detroit open up the window of vaccines to individuals uh, such as grocery store workers and you know restaurant workers, people of that nature, because it seems like there's still a huge backlog with individuals that are 65 and older or those that have underlying health issues. Yeah, um, you know that news came out uh, recently, and um, you know I can only speak for the hospital community and that we are still following the state's priority groups. Um, we have not started into additional workers such as food service workers. Um, that would be a question for the city um, and, and perhaps the state on um, and understanding the exact reasoning behind moving into those groups at this point. Ruth Ann Sutterith with us here on the Megacast. She's the Senior Vice President, Public Affairs and Communications for the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. I will say I'm 
kind of excited to be at the back end of the bus <laughs> when it comes to the vaccine because there still seems to be so many questions. And I'm also hoping the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine comes out because I would much rather get one shot uh, <laughs> rather than two. Uh, but we're also hearing, um, you know, there's a new study going on about can you mix these vaccines? And for the individuals that have already had their first dose, um, should they look into if like, you know, uh, getting that second dose from Moderna versus Pfizer or vice versa? At this point, it's very important to get the same second dose as the first dose. So if you got Moderna, get your second Moderna and get it at the same provider location. Um, people need to go back to wherever they got their first shot because that's where the second doses are, are being shipped. And so um, that's the important thing to do right now. It's very early on in the studies about mixing vaccines and understanding that if we get to a point where there's a shortage, um, will it be effective to get a different type of second dose? So where are we on the state levels as far as uh, how many vaccines are we getting and are we starting to get more because it has been such a slow start to this process? Yes, we started out with quite a bit and then it, it really, um, the numbers dropped a lot, you know, in early January, mid January. And so uh, we were very excited to see President Biden announce that there will be 16% increases in state allotments and now another 5%. So that's a 21% that's a increase. That's tens of thousands of vaccines um, more, you know, into Michigan than we were getting in previous weeks. So that's, that's great news. Um, and in terms of nationally, we are currently sitting right around seventh or eighth uh, in terms of total number of vaccines given. Um, and, and we had started much lower in the ranks uh, earlier on in this process. So um, Michigan is a leader in a lot of things and we wanna be a leader in vaccinating our state as well. And most definitely, because there have been a lot of issues with this. I know that uh, Mark Hackle, the uh, executive, uh, county executive from Macomb County has been making a big issue of his county not getting what he believes to be a fair a number of some of these vaccines. And I know that you can't speak to how they're being distributed to individual counties and things of that nature. But also uh, for the people that are still hesitant about getting the vaccine, what do you want them to know? That's a great question. We want them to know that despite this vaccine being developed more quickly, than some others have been developed, safety steps were not skipped. Um, this vaccine has gone through rigorous trials uh, and peer review uh, you know, studies and um, very intense scrutiny at the CDC level by a group of medical professionals uh, who do this for a living. And they have determined that the vaccines available are safe and effective. And um, that's the most important thing for people to know. Um, they would not be out there if that were not the case. And uh, we're seeing um, most of our healthcare providers take the vaccine uh, and now luckily a lot of other community members. So it's safe and effective. Uh, it went through the same types of processes that all other vaccines go through to demonstrate that. And obviously there are additional vaccines that are in the process of getting approval, which will help speed up trying to get uh, the entire country to herd immunity so that we can be on the backside of this pandemic. But with that, uh, your thoughts on some of these um, people, we're hearing a lot about line cutters, people that are able to get the vaccine that really don't qualify for it right now. How is that even able to happen? Yes, you know, um, first I wanna say that um, we've got 10 million people in our state and um, all, of the, all of their lives are equally valuable. And so no vaccine is wasted, but we also want people to wait their turn. Um, and uh, the, the people doing the vaccinations are doing everything they can to verify that uh, folks who are getting the vaccine are, are qualified to do so. Uh, so it's not been a perfect process, but everyone's trying to do better and, and do their best to ensure that our most vulnerable people who are in those priority groups right now, especially our seniors and our teachers are getting the vaccine um, and, and are at the front of the line. Yeah, it's so important to, uh, to know that as well. And uh, as we go forward, you know, so much of the conversation has really shifted to the vaccine. What is the latest though really happening with the testing? Is there still a backlog at some of the labs that trying to get the test 
um, you know, uh, back so that we can make it in like a timely fashion. Yes, you know, getting that test back uh, quickly is so important so that people don't go uh, back out and uh, into the community if, if they know they have COVID uh, or if they don't. Um, so um, luckily testing uh, has been a very uh, smooth process in, in the uh, past several months, um, especially compared to early on. It's much easier to get a test now uh, and, and there are a lot more sites to do so. Uh, we haven't heard of any significant backlogs uh, and I know that uh, folks can go to places like um, their, their hospital or their health department or the CVS down the road uh, and, and get a test and get their results fairly quickly at this point. So the state has a really great test finder tool on the Michigan.gov uh, coronavirus website. And people uh, can definitely check that website if they're looking for a place to get a test. Well, great information uh, for all of our listeners and viewers. And so Ruth Ann Sutterith with us on, she's the Senior Vice President for Public Affairs and Communications with the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. We appreciate your time, but also your expertise on this subject. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. Well, we'll have you on again soon because uh, as much as we like for this pandemic to be behind us, I think we still have a ways to go. So thank you again. And that's going to wrap it up for today's edition of the Megacast.